Imagine you are warriors. Do you feel like warriors? Imagine you've got a kilt on and you've got your sword and tomorrow you're going on to Culloden Moor. If it wasn't for whiskey in Scotland, there'd be no Scotland. It's, there's nothing else left. Push the glass away from you three times and as you do that, you cry out the words what, what we've got now, 21st century whiskey entering another boom period. You've got distillers building new distilleries. You know, new distilleries haven't been built in Scotland for, for years and years and years. Stillish! Stillish! We've created something new. We've brought into the world something that's never been seen. Slancher! 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 When two English wine merchants, Mark Rainey and his business partner Simon Coughlin, joined forces with two Gaelic-speaking islanders on a hare-brained business scheme, they changed the Isle of Whiskey industry forever. It's very bright, it's very clear, it's very fresh. Focusing on a small independent distillery, we witnessed the birth of the first new single malt whiskey in Scotland for decades. We debunk some mythology and uncover the art of the master blender. Five years ago, master blender Jim McEwen and distillery manager Duncan McGilvery stashed away hundreds of oak casks full of whiskey. So, Dunky boy, here we go. These casks have been lying in darkness in an old warehouse, undisturbed and untouched. Five years on here. Lovely bead on it as well. It's really, really good. When you go into a glass of whiskey, apart from the wonderful aromas and the taste and all that you get, it's truly a mirror image of the people who made it. The personality and the character of the men who made it should evolve from the glass. When you look at a painting, it's signed by an artist, and you say, ah, that's the style of the artist. Well, this is signed by artists as well. Guys who make single malt whiskey the way we do, traditional style, each and every man in that distillery is an artist. Jim and Duncan were instrumental in bringing back to life an old and defunct Isla distillery. Well, we sniff at that, see what you think. A distillery closed and abandoned during one of the many recessions endured by the Scottish whisky industry. Late 1970s whisky industry had continued to be sort of producing more and more whisky, but sales were declining. And it was, the industry was kind of state of denial. It said, oh, no, these young people will give up drinking vodka, you know, they'll come back to their drams. Yeah, yeah right, you know. Uh, you know, vodka is still the number one uh, spirit in the UK. They didn't come back. And suddenly there's this surplus of whiskey. And Baruch Laddie was sadly, uh, and I think wrongly, but sadly uh, deemed as being surplus to requirements. There was enough stocks sitting around from that period of overproduction and it was felt that, that, well, you could just shut the distillery down and just wait for things maybe to get better. After years of part-time production, employing only a skeleton staff, the distillery was eventually wound down and closed in 1994. But 400 miles away, a casual interest in the whisky industry was about to set in motion a very ambitious rescue plan. Mark Renier was making a name for himself as a vintner in London. He also sold small amounts of specialist malt whisky, including some of the old Brookladdy stock. During a cycling holiday in the west coast, he paid a visit to the distillery to find out for himself just how the spirit was made. He turned up at Brochladi uh, with his brother, I believe it was, and the gates of Brochladi were closed. And the gates were all rusted, and there was a sign on the door, on the gate. It said, plant closed. <laughs> plant? This is not plant, this is a distillery. No visitors! Exclamation mark. I saw someone cross the yard, so I rattled the gates and the guy came over. 
And he said, excuse me, sir, is there any chance of a tour of the distillery? And the guy said, no, you can fuck off. <laughs> no, fuck off. <laughs> so I left uh, uh, with the tail firmly between my legs. I think that made his desire to buy the distillery even more, hoping he'd find this guy so he could sack him. Rennie, now determined to buy Brookladdy, began writing regularly to a succession of distant owners, pleading with them to let him purchase the distillery. But he was continually turned down. At the same time, the local community was doing everything in its power to force the then owners, White and Mackay, to reopen the distillery. I um, started a campaign and um, got over a thousand signatures from people, um, wrote to White and Mackay, explained to them what effect the closure of Brookladdy Distillery was having on a small community like Isla. And in essence, basically, we stopped the sale of White and Mackay whisky. It was a boycott, basically, and it was amazing the amount of feeling that it generated on the island because it did have a huge effect and almost every village in this island has its own distillery so that everybody could empathise with what was happening in Brookladdy. But for the grace of God, it could be them and mm -hmm. it could be their village, it could be their community. Uh, lively community that was being affected. During the last 150 years, Scotland has lost almost 250 distilleries, with Isla taking more than its fair share of the closures. Only seven of the original 20 survived. This turbulent history left many of the remaining distilleries, including Brookladdy, with an increasingly uncertain future. And of course, during this period, the distillery had been subjected to various changes of ownership. Um, as Invergordon was bought out by, by White and Mackay, and White and Mackay had sold to Jim Beam brands, and Jim Beam brands had been bought by Fortune brands. This West Coast distillery suddenly ended up in the ownership of a multinational, ginormous American company, um, who I'm sure they probably didn't even know they had it. So I wrote to the American board because I knew that they wouldn't share the same industry view of, right, you know, if we're not going to use it, no one else is. And I had an answer very quickly after that, saying, yep, sure, you know, we'll, we'll sell it. But there was a proviso. The new owners, Fortune Brands, issued Mark with an ultimatum. The money had to be in their bank account by Friday, December the 19th, at midday. And the ultimatum was that if it's not there Friday, midday, everything's off. I then had to go back to all our shareholders and had to get them to all send their money pretty damn pronto. So all this money was arriving into our bank account at the solicitor's office. Um, but we were £400,000 short. And five minutes to 12, well, four minutes to 12, um, my, the door bursts open, in comes my solicitor, followed by the seven other solicitors that had been working on this. To witness this final humiliation of this prat who sort of had this ridiculous idea to buy a distillery and, you know, when it came to the crunch, couldn't actually, you know, talk to a good game, but couldn't actually, you know, deal with it. And they called the cash desk and he said, um, has any money come for, you know, for Mark? The girls say, well, actually, something's just come in. My spirits pick up and, 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 and she said, oh, yes, yeah, so something's just come in. Let me just, let me just, uh, and you could hear her, you know, with a calculator, you know, calculating this stuff. You know, oh, no, that's wrong. Oh, that, that, that. Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. The total is four million. And I went, yeah! <laughs> Just jumped in the air and danced around and around this table. Yeah, 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 yeah. And all these, you know, sit down, calm down, calm down. I said, oh, bugger off. I'm <laughs> and I was just zooming around the place. One minute to 12. This was the news that Jim McEwen was waiting for. After nearly 40 years at the famous Bowmore Distillery, Jim made a decision that transformed the life of his family and Isla's whisky industry. I was interviewing Jim McEwen for, for Whiskey Magazine and we'd walked out from Bamore and we were sitting on the beach at Bamore and we were just having a chat, and just, just doing an interview, so I thought, we'll get out of the distillery. And he said to me, he said, see that place across there? 
you should watch out for that one, you know. I have my eyes set on it. And he was manager of Promore at the time. And that was a kind of little first, well, he kind of told me roughly what was going to happen. And it was fantastic. I had to keep stumm for, for a while, but fantastic news. I have to say, I take my hat off to him, his courage for doing so. Because, you know, you're you know, approaching retirement age, you've been 40 years with the one company. To jump ship at that last minute, you know, that takes an awful lot of courage, especially with some nutter from down south on a harebrained scheme about sort of getting this thing going. So, so, so I, I, I have to take my hat off that he had the courage to do so. When Jim McEwen walked into that distillery, it was, he was the one that was in, really trying to get it going. And uh, Jim walked into that and thought to himself, my God, what have I done? I've really bitten off more than I can chew this time. But Jim had a secret weapon. Fellow Islander and mechanical genius Duncan McGilvery. Duncan had spent most of his working life in the Brook Laddie Distillery, during which he was made redundant no less than three times. I went down to the Port Charter Hotel with Mike, uh, Simon and Jim just to discuss the finer points. And later on in the evening the question came, would I guaranteed to have the distillery up and running in the last week in May. Um, so two more drums and I said yes, we'll, <laughs> we'll do it. Um, I walked in three weeks later and thought, my God, what have I done here, you know. The machinery was creaking, there was a lot of rust, the walls were black. There was a big job ahead of us. And we got stuck in and we did open up at the end of May. So, um, you know, the first bit it ran on the 29th of May at 8.26 in the morning. First distillation went fine, and then on the second distillation, what you're looking for is the heart of the spirit, the real heart of it. Couldn't find it, the whiskey wouldn't clear at all. I'm thinking, wow, all these guys, a lot of expectation for the future. They're all standing around? Yeah, they're all standing around about waiting. It was like Bell Hill maternity, you know what I mean? They were waiting for the baby to be born. I was thinking, well, we borrowed three and a half million pounds. We've got investors who have invested three million pounds. This is, this is a lot of pressure, you know? It really was a lot of pressure to try and make it happen. And then suddenly it just cleared. Just like that, went crystal clear. We added the water to the spirit that remained clear. And suddenly, Brachadi was back. In 43 years of making whiskey at that time, the best moment in my life in 43 years was watching the first whiskey trickling back through the line of the Brookladdy stills. That was the best moment in 43 years. And a million miles and a thousand barrels, that was the best moment. For master blenders like Jim, whiskey production is both an emotional and intellectual process well aware that any tweaks or tiny changes during this long process can have a major effect on taste, colour and smell. Professor Paul Hughes of the International Centre for Brewing and Distilling at Heriot Watt University has been studying the technical attributes of our national drink for years. If you take the same whisky, fill two Olympic pools next to each other, I know it's not a normal configuration but bear with me, don't jump in because it's not very safe but if you take let's say two or three drops of a quite a flavor active compound some sulfur compounds for instance and drop it into one and not the other one will taste totally different to the other analytically that's difficult to find but from a flavor perspective it's really apparent do you like it yeah, yeah it's great now on the palate the peat comes alive taste it please taste it you're the first paper in the world. God, how lucky you are. What do you think of that taste? Isn't that Jim's Whiskey Masterclass is an opportunity to teach the whiskey faithful the basic skills of the master blender. Why did you Searching and scrutinising the complex flavours and aromas. One of the things when you're tasting whiskey is to get the mouth feel. The tongue is very sensitive. When you get young whiskey, the attack on the palate is quite ferocious. If you wanted to assess a, a whiskey flavour, the first thing to do is, is, to, is to nose it, sniff it. Um, and then once you've done that, you can actually sip it. And what happens is you get, you get a taste, you might get a burn from the alcohol, for instance. 
And then there's a so-called retronasal effect, so the flavours are actually evaporating off the tongue, back up through the nose, and you can detect them in that way. Watch the eye on moving. Look at that. Wow. I'll just split it for you, I'll just split it. There you go, you see the oil at the top and the water below. I think it's always a good idea when you're tasting whiskey to do it before and after addition of water because some whiskies improve with addition of water and some whiskies, in my view, get worse. The myth about whether you add water or not is a myth, it's a matter of taste and I think depends on the whiskey itself. But what are the fundamental components of whiskey? What is it made from? And just exactly what is it? Whiskey is, is basically a distilled beer concentrate. Um, we take beer at 8% alcohol and we distill it, if, for a malt whiskey, you distill it twice. And then you take that alcohol that you collect and you put it into wooden casks and you leave it there for three years minimum. As simple as that? As simple as that. But you can't do it at home. And it's a product of, of people. It's a product of people's skills. It's taking barley, it's malting barley, bringing it back to life, really. Malting it, grinding it, distilling it, putting it to sleep in, in wood for a long time. So there's time involved, there's landscape involved. Whiskey is natural, it's a natural, natural product. And that's kind of what's unexpected about it. And that's really what, what I think people are beginning to understand. And if you're looking at a global boom in whiskey, which, you, which we are at the moment, it's really that this heritage and this, this fact that it's a natural product, a real product, that is absolutely fundamental uh, to its success. After distilling their first spirit, the Brook Laddie Company were heading for the Great Whiskey Conundrum, waiting anything from three to 40 years before the product could be bottled and sold. In the interim, the company were reliant on the limited sellable stock that came with Brook Laddie. But there was an additional complication that pushed the company to the brink. Simon Coughlin, Mark's right-hand man in all the previous ventures, is the company's director of operations, chief bottle washer and business guru. The trouble is that certainly to start with the timing of the purchase, we originally expected it to happen in, in the sort of summer of 2000, which, which meant we would have got the Christmas season in that first year, whereas it happened on the you know, 19th of December, which meant nothing. And also, previous owners had sold off most of the bottled stock, so we started in January. We had a whole you know, financial year, and we had overheads for a whole year. Uh, and by the time the packaging was out, you know, it was September. So we had nine months of virtually no income. I said it was a nightmare. So we, we did go back to shareholders twice, in fact, in the first two years, which, you know, once is, once is um, you know, reasonable. I think twice was taking the piss a bit. We made the final decision that we should make three people redundant, the two of which was, was one of our founders. Um, Gordon uh, Wright, uh, one of my best best friends, um, I'm glad to say still is, um, and, and my wife who was working for the business at the time, or my wife who was my wife then, and so it was, it was difficult, it was very difficult, uh, but uh, still talking to both of them, so that's, uh, that's a good thing. It was during this financial downturn that the team unknowingly made a decision that later became the foundation of another whiskey venture. Adding momentum to today's great whiskey revival. When we had no money, because we started from scratch and uh, we, we, we um, finally made a profit in 2004, we should have made one in 2003, but for some reason we didn't because... I heard about uh, a distillery being up for sale. And Duncan and I are always looking around for scrap where we can. So there's a little distillery uh, tucked inside a huge distillery, which was called the Barton Distillery. And we went out there with a view to buying two wooden vats for the bottling hall, which we were going to build at the time. When we got there, we found a small distillery called Inverleven within the complex. Now, Inverleven was a malt distillery about the size of Brew Laddie. So I managed to work a deal with this guy and we bought all the complete contents of Inverleven Distillery. And he came to me and said, look, you know, we've got this chance to, uh, to you know, basically to steal a, a complete distillery. And it's going to cost us very little. It's going to cost us 20 grand or something. A usual gym underestimation. 
um, but there's a proviso. We've got to do it uh, within three weeks. That was on a Thursday. We were out there on a the Sunday with the van and all the tools, about six of us. I'm slowly and carefully dismantled what was in the leaving distillery. But we had to get it through the walls, and the walls were like that thick, and it was up high. So we used the international currency. We took cases and cases of whiskey with us. So we became extremely friendly with the demolition guy. So if you wanted a hole in the wall, you gave the guy in the big ball and chain, you gave him a couple of bottles, and suddenly the, a hole that would have taken the Titanic. So that was fine, with the hole in the wall, and you get the guy with the crane for a bottle of whiskey, and very quickly, we had more heavy plant working for us than George Wimpy. Duncan had the idea of getting a barge alongside and then just craning everything onto this barge and off it went down the Clyde. It must have been great for uh, the guys at Lafroig and Ardbeg and uh, Lagavulin. If any of them were looking out the window with the glasses and they said, oh, there's a couple of pot stills going by. <laughs> what the hell's going on? <laughs> Jesus, I'm sure I saw two pot stills going down the coast. <laughs> Uh, you're drinking too much, John. Uh, you need to lay off it. And we've basically been using spare parts ever since from that, you know, because, it's a, you know, as I said, it's an old distillery. So whenever we need something new, a bit of pipe or a bit of whatever, you know, it comes from, from that stockpile of stuff. But we've still got all this machinery, so what are we going to do with it? Now, there used to be a distillery at Port Charlotte two miles down the road, a very pretty village. Um, it was built in 1829, and it was closed in 1929, 100 years later. And we owned some of the buildings down there. And so it sort of became like a, well, you know, we own the buildings, we own this machinery, well, let's put them together and create the Port Charlotte Distillery. Um, and overall, that's giving the shareholders, which actually, at the end of the day, are the people that own this business, it gives them added value. Uh, and of course, we're shareholders and all our staff are shareholders as well. So it's building the business for them. It gives us options, you know. Yeah. We don't know what's going to be happening in 20, 30 years' time. Uh, but it gives you options for the future, for, you know, possible sale, part of, all out of, who knows. The only standing structures left of the old Port Charlotte distillery are the vast warehouses, now used to store the first spirit ever produced by Brook Laddie. And five years on, today is a very special day. So here we are five years down the line. We've obviously changed dramatically in five years. It's been really hard work uh, keeping Brookladdy going. But financially now it looks so much better because we've got our own whiskey which we can sell. So the future looks really, really bright for Brookladdy. And the fact of the matter also is this is Port Charlotte. And hopefully, if God's in his heaven, we will be making Port Charlotte in this very building sometime over the next year, year and a half, two years. So it's great to have five years worth of stock in the image of what you hope to produce uh, in two years' time. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that five-year wait again. That's just opened up beautifully now. Just, just a bit of air, you know, once the air gets into the whiskey, it just, it just opens up superbly. Uh, it was like watching E.T., this gap getting closer and closer, I think, you know, can, can, have we got the money to do it? Can we keep going? And suddenly, today, it's like we've touched it. We've, we've, we've crossed the void, which is really, really good. And this will sell well, and we're really proud of it. The new spirit has taken two miles down the coast to its place of origin, the Brook Laddie Distillery. With 43 staff, it's the biggest private employer on Isla and helping stabilise the declining population for the first time in decades. It's one of 90 distilleries across Scotland contributing 2.5 billion to the British economy. It's another milestone because this is a brand new whiskey. I can't remember the last time a new whiskey was made in Scotland. I mean, it's decades now. I mean, this is really great. And you know, as I probably said to you before, I've seen when I started in this business, there was 125 distilleries making single malt. Today, there's probably 86. So here we go, we've got 87. There's one more.
<laughs> it's kicking. Oh, 63.5. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, what we've got now, 21st century whiskey entering another boom period. You've got distillers building new distilleries. You know, new distilleries haven't been built in Scotland for, for years and years and years. The industry's been kind of scared. You know, distilleries were being closed down at the beginning of the 1980s. Now you've got plants making, what, 15 million litres a year getting, getting built. That shows the confidence uh, that's in the Scotch whisky industry at the moment. And it's based on an increase in sales. Uh, and it's not just an increase in sales in Europe or maybe a couple of markets. It's a global thing. Absolutely. Try not to you know, China's beginning to drink whisky. India, perhaps, if the tax issues sorted out, it's going to be drinking whisky. Russia, Poland, Vietnam, Mexico. South Africa, all these countries are beginning to grow and become really, really interested in whisky. And they're drinking blends and they're drinking single malts. There's a smile coming out there. That's lovely stuff. <laughs> lovely stuff. Whisky is like a signifier of success, you know. If, you, if you've made it, you know, you've got your BMW, you've got your nice house, you've got your nice suit, what's the next thing? It's really interesting when you ask these people in, say, South Africa or Mexico or wherever, this stuff is a signifier that they've actually made it, you know. It's like, think about confidence. It looks good. It tastes great as well. Whiskey, yeah, good times are back. <laughs> well done, indeed. Good one. So, uh, great stuff. moment for us. That's us. We've made it. Uh, the waiting is over now. So all we have to do now is transfer this next door and then we run it down the bottling line. For all the staff, the bottling of the Port Charlotte five-year-old whisky is the pinnacle of the last five years' work. But the creation of the new whisky means different things to the two champions of the distillery. But it's particularly good for myself because standing beside me was my wife Barbara, and you know we've been together for 35 years as a married couple, and we've gone back and forward in the whisky business, and she's always carried the strain of living with Jim McEwen, who's been travelling the world and never home and brought the kids up herself and she comes from Port Charlotte and this whiskey was called Port Charlotte so you gave me the best woman in the world and I'm giving you back the whiskey. That's what it meant for me. We've created something new. We've brought into the world something that's never been seen. Uh, uh, um, this is a, a new Isla whiskey that we've created, and we did it ourselves. And this is the final, you know, it's all about doing things. You know, people, some people talk a lot, and they'll promise lots, and they'll give you lots of chat, and this and that, and everything. But they don't actually get around to doing anything. And this, this was our doing. We did this. We did it. And here it is. This is the proof, so to speak. <laughs> Excuse the pun.